Okay. Let's see where that. Okay, it is recording in this moment. Hello everyone, welcome to the last session of the web of the webinar. I will join John. Uh, you have questions, remember you need to question some comments to the to Martin or also to the help desk. Uh, Martin. Okay. Uh, let me just set up this other machine. Be right there so I can see the chats. Okay, good. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. And thank you for uh, sticking in with us. Um, let me go here. And oh, are you? I'm trying to share my screen. There it is. It just was slow. Never mind. Let's get there. Good. So um, today's lesson is kind of a wrap up. And um, I called it stuff, folders, files, and things that go bump in the night. In other words, basically for uh, tips and things to know about in debugging Green Global. As an administrator, as you know, if you've been using Green Global, things do go wrong sometimes. And um, <clears throat> so I've just compiled a list of various things. When, uh, when Carlos asked me to put this webinar series together, again, I, I thought of the admin tool and all the different features, but I also immediately thought <clears throat> of some of the things that I want to talk about today. Because as an administrator, you need to be aware and um, I'm sure some of you know a lot of this stuff, but if you're fairly new, maybe some of this, and so I hope everybody learns at least something new today. And also I'd like to, if we have time, which I think we will, at the end of the uh, session, if anybody else can speak up on anything that they have discovered or tips, and I wanna talk more about that uh, at the end here. So let's get started. So before I get started, uh, just um, if you have any questions now or um, as always, you can send us questions later to Juan Carlos and myself. Um, we've covered, as you know, so far we talked about the admin tool and we started, it sounds like, or seems like a long time ago, um, but it was only two weeks ago when we started talking about how to add users. And um, then we talked about the data views and how to map your data from your database and how to do searches. And we talked in our last lesson on security. So all of these things are important to understand. And again, if you have any questions, they will probably you know, come at some later date, that's fine. But does anybody have anything right now they would like to ask? And I apologize, I know Sarah sent me some late yesterday. Uh, some of those were really not as relevant to the admin uh, discussion as to other parts of Green Global like the curator tool. So Sarah, I'll get back with you when I have a chance. I have another webinar later today, but I will follow up. But anything uh, with the topics that we've covered so far? And you could write it in chat or you could speak up. Well, let's get rolling. One of the things several people have said they've had problems with the videos. We'll check this out and make sure that we get those. And I'm not sure how go to meeting if they archive them or what, but we'll put them in a place where we can permanently make sure we have those. I guess worst case, I could record the session and talk to myself. <laughs> uh, but we'd like to get the ones we already did. So, uh, I'm going to start first talking about the files and folders on a user's PC. And I have just found some of this uh, to be very helpful as I've worked with the curator tool to debug it. So I'd like to share some of the things. And 
Some of this, I'm sure, is old news to you guys. I know Edwin knows this because Edwin is the master at creating wizards, his team in uh, SIP. Um, on the user's PC, there's a folder called Program Files Green Global, Green Global Curator Tool. And if you look at this screen on the left side, you see there are four folders. Um, typically, you never really ever need to worry about the forms or images. So these two folders here, there's a few forms. There's literally four forms in there. And images are the images that come with Green Global, all the little icons and things like that. And again, you typically don't need to change those. I actually have directions somewhere in one of my documents, it might be the AT guide, about how to redo the images and put your own icons. And I spent some time a couple of years ago with an intern and we actually created a bunch of int uh, a bunch of icons for the tree view on the left side. But um, you, if you didn't like those, you could change those, but that's so minor, it's not worth talking about really. But the other two folders I do want to talk about, and the first one I'm talking about here is wizards. And anytime you install a new wizard for, Grin, for the curator tool, that wizard goes, the DLL file, corresponding file goes into this folder. And um, this next uh, screen, there's a little tip here. Um, I always uh, will test a wizard, and then if I don't want to use it for whatever reason, or if it's giving me a problem, I will change the extension. I typically change it to D-U-L-L. And then if I restart the curator tool, it does not know that that uh, file is there. So a small tip, I actually have different versions of wizards and I can go back and check. Um, one of the problems we have going forward is people develop wizards, they need sometimes specific data views or they need uh, perhaps a certain field that wasn't in an earlier schema. And we really, Green Global as a community, we really should be coming up with a strategy uh, for how we indicate the requirements of each wizard, but that's a bigger story than this lesson today. Um, this other folder that's in that same, it's a subfolder, that same main folder, program files, Green Global, et cetera, is the reports folder. And I know a lot of you using um, Green, Green Global and the curator tool may not be using these reports as they were designed. Um, I guess a lot of them were kind of pertinent to the NPGS, but they also could be used in a, in a case uh, generically a little bit. But um, it, it also is true that if you created your own crystal reports, those reports would need to go in this folder. And um, they have that extension that Crystal Reports uses, RPT. So the only thing I typically have in that folder are RPT files. And I'm going to talk in a little bit that there's another linkage that we need to make with these uh, reports. So it's not as simple. Uh, sometimes people think, oh, I put the, the, the report files in this folder. Why aren't they working? And that's what the next couple of slides are going to talk about. So. What I did here was created a screen of the curator tool. You can tell I'm in the inventory data view, and I'm currently looking at a couple of records. And if I right click, I get the context menu, and one of the options is reports. Now, the reason that's working is because there have been some reports for inventory that the curator tool is aware of. In other words, these reports here have been what we say, let me fix, I don't know, it's coming out, okay. Um, my screen is showing Zoom funny, but anyway, it looks like it's working on my other screen, so. Um, the, the, let me just check 
for a second. Juan Carlos, on your screen, are you seeing the bottom of my PowerPoint where it says, uh, the last line says for inventory records? Mm, you say for inventory record. Only At I the see very the... bottom. Yeah. No, only I see the, the screen, the curator yeah. of the screen. Yeah. Yeah, I see the... five reports expected to be listed for inventory records, yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure on the zooms of the go to the meeting screen, it almost looks like it's not capturing that, but I can see it on my other screen, so we're good. Anyway, so these specific reports that are showing up here are available for the inventory records, and there is a connection that needs to be made, and it's done through what is called mapping. And I'm going to show you that here. Now, in this case, if I were debugging and, and I realized as a administrator that I had five reports, but only four of them are showing up, then I need to start debugging. Well, like, well, what's the problem? Where do I go look? Well, the first thing I would do is I would go back to here and look in this folder and I would look to see are these files here? And then also are the extensions correct? So that's what this slide is showing you. So in this case, for whatever reason, when the file was saved, here's the file extension and it was RPTT. And so it was not recognized by the curator tool. It has to be RPT. Now, that's one of the problems, but here's the other problem that can, can occur. And that's uh, the report mapping isn't correct. And let me show you what that's all about. So in order for reports to work, the, when, when a designer is in Crystal Reports Designer and they're creating those reports, they're actually using, um, in the 32-bit world, I used to create them back then a couple years ago, and I would put all the data into a spreadsheet and, and map, the, <clears throat> map the, uh, the report to the spreadsheet fields. And um, we actually have a new feature, if you look at the release notes for the curator tool, um, we've, I'm not gonna go into that too much right now, but there's, a new option for generating a copy of the current data that's in your curator tool, and it actually puts it out in the table in your database. And then you could create, if you had a designer, you could uh, go against that data. But anyway, I kind of digress. The reports need to have a data view open in order to run. And this is coordinated by a file and the file is called reports mapping dot text. And it looks something like this. So you can see the name of the report is in the left column. I'm just in a notepad looking at the text. It's a text file. And um, the left hand column is the name of the report and you see it with the dot RPT equals. And then it's actually pointing to a data view. So viability wizard get inventory viability label is a data view that is in the curator tool. Uh, it's in the green global with all the data views. Get inventory, another data view. Um, here's one in this case, um, where is it? Um, well, this, um, what am I looking at? I was there was one I was wanted to look at that was a little bit different here. Oh, okay, it's this one right here. The the three by three packet label report, that file actually is used in two different places. So it's used by the order wizard, get packet label. So there's a data view. If we were to go look, we could find that data view under the wizards and then also it's used by the order wizard get order request item 
Now I got to come back. There's another thing I got to talk about too. But for the general uh, rule of thumb, a lot of these reports are mapped specifically to a data view. In some cases, we also have to talk about the wizards and I'll come back to that too. But the question I'm asking here is, so where is this file stored? Okay. And that's in another folder that's on the user's PC. Okay. So if I were to go out on the PC of the user's PC, typically on the C drive, doesn't have to be, but typically under Windows on the wherever, whatever drive, I actually had a computer where Windows was not on the C drive. It used to drive me nuts. But um, anyway, it's typically the Windows drive, Windows C, and then there's a folder called Program Data, which is used by a lot of Windows programs. So then there, <clears throat> there's one for Green Global, and then uh, typically, if you were to go look at it, you'd see a, a subfolder called Curator Tool, and then you'll see a lot of different uh, folders. All right. Typically, well, it depends. I should, let me stand back. If you've only used the curator tool on one database, then you're only going to see one entry over here. In my example, I've mapped, I have used the curator tool against multiple databases over time. And every time I use the curator tool with a different uh, database, then I create a corresponding folder, or you know, the Green Global does, and it puts it out here. And it actually, you can see here's the one, the fourth one down. That's the one that we currently have that Juan Carlos set up for training purposes on the cloud. And so that's one that I have a linkage to. These are USDA. Uh, one is called Dev. One is called Web. The one that I maintain is called training. Mm -hmm. And um, each one of those has these files in it. Um, I'm sorry. The, they have other files, but the main subfolder called curator tool has those three text files. And that's what I'm showing over here. So we were talking about reports mapping. And that's one of the files that I'm interested in. Okay. Now, um, it says here the first time the CT is run after the installation, after the installation, this folder, uh, it, there's another folder out there under users with the user's name, and that's created. And I'm going to demonstrate this um, because if you look for these, if you were to do a search on your um, user's PC, you're going to find these three files in at least two different places. You're going to find them here in program data. And it says the note here, it's important. I should have uh, highlighted that. Well, I did up here. This occurs when the curator tool is installed. Okay. It's putting those text files. But here's a case where those same files are placed after this is created. And uh, um, after the, I'm sorry, but I'm uh, too early in the morning. After the CT is first run, this folder gets created. So what's the big deal? Let me, let me uh, get out of these slides. I'm actually going to demonstrate this and show you what I'm talking about. So let's see. I think I've got all these folders open. Um, let's see what I've got. Okay. So here's the folder. And I know it might be a little bit small for you to look at, but on the left side, you can see the name of the folder screen, global curator tool. There's those four that I was talking about. Okay. And um, when I click on this subfolder, we see this stuff. Okay. 
Um, when I go, I'm going to go to program data. Let's see, is that here? I thought I had that open. Let me go look at it. Um, so here is program data. Green Global. All right. So you can see I've been pointing against a lot of different uh, databases more than what I even showed in that picture, uh, that screen. And also uh, there's my local host. So this particular computer, um, I have access to databases in servers elsewhere. But if I have the database and the full package installed on my computer, I will have the local host here as well. And I can, I'll, I'll come back to that. But the thing I was talking about is that when I install the curator tool, it puts these three files when I install it. Now, even though I might have installed it recently, there's, it's picking up files um, that are older. Okay, it actually was built with those files and it, and, and it has those. Now, um, let me, oh, let's see, I gotta get this thing from GoToMeeting out of my way. All right, I'm going to go and let me go to the, another folder. Okay. So here's that folder I was just referring to called, uh, it's under users, it's under the same drive where Windows is, users, in my case, the initials MAR, my initials, and uh, there's a folder called app data, roaming, green global, curator tool. And here are these three files. And according to this slide, um, that these are put here after the CT is first run. So I'm going to demonstrate this. Let's pretend. Let me go in here. And I'm going to kill these three files. In fact, let me do this. Let me delete this folder. So you can see I have one from before, but, um, and I'll talk about that, but there is no folder now called uh, curator tool. Oh shoot, I have the curator tool running. Um, I was gonna show you something else, okay. So let me go, I'm gonna try to show you this, this way. Oops. And now what I'm gonna try to do is bring up Windows. Good. So let's pretend, here's the scenario. Let's pretend that I just install the curator tool on the user's PC. Watch, what, watch what's happening. And I want you to watch over here on the screen. So this is the very first time we're launching the curator tool. Do you see what it just did? The very first time it creates, it goes out there and it looks for this folder, and if it doesn't exist, it creates it, all right? And I haven't done anything except launch this login, you know, from the Windows. Before I continue, I wanna open this folder. And what it's showing you is that this folder has made one entry, which is web service URL.txt. Okay, now, 
by default, let's open this. Whoops. I'm going to open this in Notepad. I want to see what's in this fi file right now. It only has one entry. So that comes by default. And that's pointing to the local host. I'll come back to that point, but let me come back to here. And again, keep your eye on this, on this screen. I'm going to continue walking through, logging in. Now look what it did. Again, pretend this was the very first time the curator tool was running on this, on this new PC or just recently installed on this PC. When I start running the curator tool, it looks for that file called appsettings.txt and it loads that. I say, okay, I'm gonna move this to the left a little bit. I'm gonna talk more about this file in a little bit. And finally, um, this is, I'm gonna go look at some um, accessions. And this is kind of interesting. When I go to inventory, um, I'm looking at inventory. Watch what happens when I go. <laughs> Unfortunately, I forgot. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to talk about this as a problem in a minute, but let's pretend I just said reports there. There are those five crystal reports. And you can see what it did. When it started to see uh, that the user was looking for these reports, it threw out this reports mapping file. So. My point of all this demonstration is that this folder will be empty or could be empty depending on the scenario. It's definitely empty when the curator tool has never been used before. All right. Um, but, and so in this case, I'm pretending that this was the first time the user was running the curator tool and these three files got generated. Now, my question to you all is, what's the big deal about this? Why am I talking about this? Um, this is one of my little, uh, those of you who know me well, know there are some things about the system that uh, will sometimes um, kind of annoy me, I guess. And this is one of them. Uh, but I'm going to close this. So I'm just going to uh, not continue. And I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But, but what's the big deal? Why, why am I bringing this up? So this is the slide we were on. So again, um, it looked pretty good. Uh, the CT was running and it was the first time. So it didn't have the files it needed. So it created them. Not a big deal most of the time. Okay. This is the thing that really bothers me. And I have answered numerous questions over the years uh, because people didn't see what they expected to see. And it's because of that first sentence. If you have a previous installation, those text files are there and they do not get overlaid. Okay. And a lot of times that's not a problem, but sometimes it is. Okay. So um, I have a tip. It says before installing a new version of CT, delete these text files in that folder or rename the folder. So I typically rename the folder so that I have a copy of what was working for me and then I can use those. Okay. Now I put the caveat here. Uh, 
it's not always a big deal, but it is sometimes. And the question is when? When is this a problem? If the mapping has changed, in other words, back to when I was talking about the report files, if for some reason you have new crystal report files, that means that those, that mapping file has changed or it needs to change. And so that's, it, then it becomes a big deal. And we've seen this over the years with the USDA because over time they have modified the report files and they've you know, made new ones and removed old ones. And then our users were, will say, well, I just, I'm not seeing those files. Even if they've even if they've installed a fresh copy of the curator tool. In other words, let's suppose we sent out an announcement and said uh, we've just uh, made some changes. There's a new version of the curator tool. They will install it, and then they call us up or they send an email. And they say I'm, I'm not seeing these reports, and this is the reason because the curator tool uh, respected the existing text files and it didn't overlay them, okay? So um, if those files, not there, are in here, they don't get overlaid, okay? And let me go back to my particular uh, folder. Where is it? All right. No, that's not the one. Program files here. Okay. Um, so again, what I typically do, uh, you don't have to do this. I'm not saying you have to. I just am frequently changing my curator tool. Um, so I will typically make a copy of the folder. I will copy it, put a date on it, and so if I look at this folder, which is not currently being used by the CT, oh, let me, remember when we were looking here and I looked at this file, where was it, uh, web service. It was only pointing to one server. But when I use my curator tool, I usually have it so that I can point to multiple servers. And that's because this is the text file um, that I normally would want to have in this folder. If I open up this text file, that's the pointing, <clears throat> and it's, I should widen this. This web service URL text file is, the, the formatting doesn't really matter, just to make it easier to read. Um, this text file is pointing to all these different servers. And so when I start the, the uh, CT, as you know, you get that login screen, and on that screen there's a button that says uh, web services or something like that, and when you click, uh, well, actually, in the drop down, the user sees all the different um, servers. So, like right now, when I open up the curator tool, if I go to here, well, first of all, if there's nothing else in the drop down. If I go to here, that's at only one entry. All right. Now, I'm going to take this file and copy it to here. Replace the file. And now I'm going to start the CT. and the drop down's working the way I expected it to. So that's because all of these guys 
have been mapped, so to speak, in this web services file. Okay. Now, another tip, if you're in your organization, if you have a lot of CT users, you don't want to have to go in there and manually have them do all that stuff with the curator tool and set up servers and point to servers. What you could do is copy this file that has the mappings, right? So typically you might have a training server and a production server, or maybe you, for whatever reason you're doing some testing. Uh, in any case, you could take that file and then uh, have them uh, put that in that folder, you could do that for them as the administrator or whatever. So um, just, you know, it's a little shortcut. Again, the problem I'm pointing out, maybe I'm making a big deal out of it, but it definitely has come into many questions over the years, is that these files are respected when you install a new curator tool and I would have taken a different approach here. I would have said, raise the question to the user. If this is the first time that the CT was installed, is being used, do you want to keep your existing da 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 da, these three files, and then go on? But it doesn't ask them that, it just assumes that they do. And in some cases, they don't, and then they don't understand what's happening. So I guess that's enough of that lecture. Anyway, that's why I thought it was important. That was one of the main things I wanted to talk about today in this in this uh, webinar is uh, these couple of folders interact and it depends on uh, whether it's a fresh install the very first time or it's a reinstallation, an updating of the CT, okay? Now I'm gonna continue with the slides. Okay. Um, for whatever reason, there's this file called app settings text file. You saw that was one of the three files. And uh, if you open that up, it's funny. I don't know how many have ever looked at this. I'm just curious. I know some of you guys have spent more time. Have anybody gone in there and looked at this file? Just uh, if you could write in your chat, say yes or no. I'm just curious if anybody's ever looked at this particular file. Huh, interesting. Uh, I went left. Okay, well, um, it, I'm not gonna talk at length about this file, um, but, uh, this is another case of the mapping. And uh, in this case, at the bottom of the file, there's actually sections that are related to wizards and the wizard's use of crystal reports. And um, when you look at this text file, anything preceded at the left with a pound sign is a comment. But down here, Underneath that, that is not commented out. So that's actually active. What I have highlighted is actually doing something. And what it is doing, it's telling the user, or the user's uh, curator tool, that here's the reports that are available when you're in the order wizard. And likewise, the viability wizard has been mapped to use several different uh, reports, and this is how that linkage is made, okay? So um, I should have put an example when this is messed up. Um, well, I could demonstrate that. Let me show you. Let's see, I'm going to do something for a second. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I don't want you to see what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, I want to get back the curator tool to its normal 
mode. Let's see. Uh, let's see, because I have a question later for you. Let's see. So I'm launching the curator tool. And now I'm going to come back. Life is good. I'm going to go back to here and share my screen again. Okay. So um, let me just show you the problem that occurs when that file's messed up. Uh, let's go to here. I don't have any orders, but. Um, I'll just open up my accessions and then I'm going to go to the order wizard. I didn't have to open up those accessions. Okay. So the order wizard is using crystal reports and it's in this drop down that these are all listed here. Okay. So I have, over the years, people will say, well, I just reinstalled the curator tool, but the reports aren't there. They used to be there. Now, what has happened, um, if I'm, I'll just minimize this for now. Actually, I want to close this. And um, let me go to this folder. If I can find it. Ah, that's not it. It's this folder. Okay. And what I'm going to do is, is pull open that app settings text file. All right. And I'll come back and talk about that. A lot of this stuff there, I'll, I uh, since most of you have not used it, I'm not going to get into it right now, but um, all right. Um, if I comment out that line, or if this were not here, if this were missing, okay, but I'm just going to comment it out and I'm going to save this file. And I'll just, uh, I can just minimize it. Uh, let's see, I need to, I meant to close this. So now let's see what happens. All right. And I'll just go right to the order wizard. And you see in the drop down now, it's it's not finding the crystal reports files. So again, uh, if you use crystal reports, this is a big deal. And it's because something's wrong in that particular text file, uh, which in this case is the apps. I'm gonna close this again. Uh, because of this file being messed up. So again, and this is under the user. So it's not the necessarily the original file that gets installed on the other folder called program files, but um, it's here under the users. And, and so what I would typically do is say, well, look, we got to correct this or replace this particular file. So again, I'm going to go up and uh, oh, I still had that open, so I could go back to normal. Okay. This is kind of an interesting thing up here. The original idea for some of this, and uh, it's explained a little bit, it's a little bit self-documentary, 
but um, there are other parameters that you can control for the environment for the curator tool. And um, I'll just, I'm not gonna get into this because I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a minor thing, but you know how in the curator tool on the left side, which we call the list panel or the tree view panel, whichever you wanna call it. On the left side, you have defaults. When you have an item, it comes up with a name, like an accession, it includes the prefix, the number, and the suffix. Okay, well, that's controlled by this file. And you can actually change what is displayed on the left-hand side of the curator tool by editing this. And I've got some instructions elsewhere in the documentation, uh, somewhere in our body of documentation of how you can do all that. But again, that's very minor. Most people don't change it. Somebody the other day in the USDA asked me, and um, I had to go through that with them, but that's not typical. All righty, so let's continue on. All right, so we talked about that. So uh, the other thing I wanna point out here that's real important, and if you've ever read the installation guide for the curator tool, we make a big deal about this. And this is one of the biggest problems that people have when they're installing the curator tool, is that the user that's going to use that computer, <clears throat> they need to have full access to these two folders. Because as you just saw, the curator tool is using those folders and writing to those folders. And if you don't, if the user of the PC does not have those permissions, then they can't, the curator tool gets frustrated. It says, nope, I can't put stuff in those folders and it balks, it stops running. So in the process of installing the curator tool, whoever does that, in some organizations, you have to have somebody with elevated uh, Windows privileges that works as the administrator for that box and they need to make sure that user has these full privileges. Whoops. And this is what I'm talking about. So, um, you know, if I'm the administrator in the organization, I'm gonna make sure that the users of this PC have full control and modified control. And it has to be for those two folders that I designated. Uh, one is this one, program data, and the other one under uh, users. Now, I mentioned this, um, under program files, I do this a lot when I'm testing the curator tool. If, uh, like Pete Sear, as you know, is the developer of the curator tool for the USDA, if he sends me a new uh, file to install a new copy of the CT, I'll save my old stuff. So like here's one, uh, an example, before I installed the new CT, I went down into program files, et cetera, and I um, renamed that folder to 1994 so that when the curator tool is installed, it created this guy, okay? Here's one I called GG. I was lazy that day, okay? But these are really three different folders with three different versions of the CT. And if I rename, if I rename this one and put it green global dot hold uh, dash hold and took the 1994, then the next time the CT runs, it's going to use that folder. So again, we've talked a lot about this. Now this is interesting. Uh, I was talking about this earlier. Every time the curator tool points to a different database, it creates a folder under program data green global. Now, my point now, I'm not talking anymore about the text files. We've, we've talked about them enough. I'm talking about these folders and why these are uh, sometimes important to fiddle with. Sometimes your lookups, as you know, are extremely messed up for whatever reason in the curator tool. 
And the it happens for different scenarios. Sometimes the user's connection to the network server got fouled up. Maybe their uh, cure their their PC uh, stopped running while they were in the middle of updating their lookups. Who knows? There's lots of different reasons. And the bottom bullet here, uh, this happens if you're in a mode where you're the, the, the database guy, the, the person in charge of the database is overlaying a new version of the database. Now you wouldn't do this in production, but you might do this in testing. And if you were to use the same location and just replace the database, that means the user's lookups no longer match. The IDs that are in their lookups do not match anymore with the IDs of the records on the server. So what do you do? Well, you delete this whole folder, okay? Um, either delete the folder or go in here and delete all of these files. And there are many, there's, I don't know, a hundred, something like that. And what those are, those are, uh, those are essentially the files that the lookup tables are using. And you'll see there's typically two, they're like pairs. Um, like here's the cooperator lookup, cache.dat, and then there's another file that's got the similar name with RLUT. So anyway, the programmer is using these for the curator tool. So if you wipe these out, what that guarantees is when the user starts up the curator tool, they're going to have to load all their lookups. And by doing that, that's ensuring that they're going to match with the server and then they'll be valid. If you don't do this and they're seeing screwy things, until you do this, they're going to continue to see screwy things with their lookups. Now, I just threw this slide together about uh, earlier when we were talking about report. I should have moved this up earlier, but the report files, here's the latest source, and there's also installation uh, documentation for that. So I just wanted to throw those links in here. So now I want to move on to the server files. And quite frankly, because I'm not managing the server for the USDA, I don't typically have access. So I don't do as much manipulation with server files except on my own computer, on my local database. But I do depend on the guys there, Kurt Endress especially, and, and Quinn when he was here, and now Benjamin. And um, we have documented some of the issues with server files. So that's what this next session is about. So um, basically, uh, my question to you, um, how many have looked in here? So on the server, uh, okay, let me stop for a second. Mattia raised the question, how do these DAT files relate to the user's MS SQL Express, or is a local MS SQL not needed? Um, you definitely have to have a local copy and that was what I was showing. That was a local copy of the files. And that and so you you do have to have a local copy of the Microsoft SQL on that user's PC. And it's either SQL Server Express, SQL Server Community Edition, or SQL Server. So all of those files there are being uh, manipulated that way. I hope I'm answering your question, Mattia. We can talk about that some more, but um, so now I'm looking at the server, and on the server there's a folder called inetpub because of using uh, Microsoft Services IIS, and there's a folder called www root, and then when Grid Global gets installed as a server uh, on the server. It's going to create this folder, and this is all the stuff that gets installed, okay? And it's got a lot of files, a lot of folders. And um, I was looking closely this week to prepare for this, 
well, my local host, I think there's some files there that could probably be eliminated, but I'm not going to get into that. I just want to, first of all, as an administrator, I'm going to write a homework uh, problem which says, go out, look at your server, and just spend a few minutes and look at each of these folders and look what's in there, okay? Um, for instance, there's a log file. Uh, years ago in Green Global, that was not turned on by default, but now I believe it is. And um, you can see what I did in this particular folder. I renamed an existing Green Global log folder, and because I wanted to keep that as kind of like a backup, but I wanted to start a new log. And so as the curator tool and as the public website, either application, when you're making um, connections, it's writing stuff to this log file. And so as an administrator, you can use that as a debugging tool to help you start to get a sense of what was happening when an error happened. So again, look for that and take a peek. Use a text editor, it's a text file, and you can look at it. So I just copied a few lines. Uh, 12 8, uh, the password failed, but then later I was able, the user was able to get in successfully. I know a lot of times um, we'll have a user call in or email us and say, we, I had this problem, and Kurt immediately jumps to that log file. And he can get a good idea of what was going on. The other thing you can do is, um, and I'm not quite as familiar with this particular interface, but this these uh, screens are available to you under, a, a, there's a file here called GUI.ASMX, and it's on your server under Green Global, and there's about, I don't know, 16 or so of these different screens that when you run this, you can fill out these screens, and some of it's self-documenting. But um, if this GUI isn't running properly, you know you have a problem, first of all, with your server. But when it is running properly, you can fill out these different parameters and uh, get, it, it's, it's bypassing using the public website or the curator tool. It's going directly to the middle tier, and it's uh, putting in information and then getting back results. So you can test to see if the database is working properly. And um, I actually have used this uh, in the production environment. I change my password that way sometimes, but um, we don't want to get into that. Anyway, um, what else? Oh, okay. So in the administrator tool, let's go look at that for a second. So let's, uh, I don't have it open. So um, we have walked our way through in the last five lessons everything in this uh, admin tool, and, and we open this, we see the wizards, code groups, but here's where we are today, the last one. And um, we save the last because it's the best. Now, a couple pointers about web application. Uh, you can see all these different settings, which if you are connected locally, and that's the key, if you go back to the very first session, we talked about different ways you could have your server set up. And um, in some cases, you have to be on the same server. Basically, the bottom line is you have to be on the same server in order to run uh, web applications. Um, there's a couple other nodes that that's true for. But anyway, so these are various settings. You see a lot of these are for the password. Excuse me, quite a few. For instance, um, the lockout period, that's 900 uh, seconds. Uh, so if somebody gets locked out after 900 seconds, 
which, what is that? Well, whatever, do the math, um, 15 minutes, um, then it's, they're no longer locked out. They can retry again, okay? And again, a lot of this is documented, and I'll point to that to you in a minute. But it's every time I ask Kurt or you speak Quinn, you know, uh, something about web application, their response was they don't use it through the AT, okay? So they don't actually use this feature in the AT. This is what they do. Uh, and let me go back to it before I get to that. So uh, if you wanna change something, you just right click and you go to properties and you can change the settings, okay? So it's perfectly fine to use the web application. I'm not saying not to, but um, what I wanted to get to um, is that I'm getting ahead of, I got ahead of myself. Way ahead of myself. Let me go back to the screen. I had it open. Yes, I did. Uh, okay, so so I guess here's where I got way ahead of myself. The file that's in this folder, and again, I'm now looking on the server, is web config. So that's the exact file that web application in the AT is looking at. So you can open that with a text editor of your choice, um, or if you have Microsoft's tools, but I don't. I'm sorry, I opened the... Where is it? Let me go back to here. Wrong place. There it is. All right, so this is the same file the web application is, is, is pointing to. And I believe the reason why he, uh, Brock, originally put it there was to prevent you from getting the stuff you shouldn't be uh, changing. You can see in the orange in my text editor the different uh, parameters that you can change. And uh, the first couple are up at the top now under connection strings. And this is what connects you with passwords uh, to the GG user and GG search um, accounts. And I believe we talked about these earlier, but these are accounts that get installed um, with, in order to uh, use this uh, public website and the curator tool. So there are accounts that are in the database. And then here are all those different parameters. So you can change the parameters. Um, some of them are documented a little bit, but the documentation exists. Um, and we put that, if you look up here, settings doc URL, I asked for this. So this is a file that's out there online that explains these different parameters, okay? And that's what we're talking about in this slide. All right, if you go to that file, and I'm, going to, I'm running out of time here, so I'm not gonna go into it, but uh, for your homework, look at this file, and it will explain the different parameters that you can change in web applications. 
And it says here that you know can change things like the public website parameters. And um, I asked Juan Carlos the other day, what does he typically change in web application? And his response was, one of the big things everybody has to do is change their server settings for the e email. You could also change the help file locations. So I know a lot of the Green Global organizations use the help file that we create, that I create, but um, you could have your own if you wanted to. And you could also point to your own uh, web page and you can modify other things uh, regarding the gene bank name that appears on the, on the public website. And here are some of the parameters that Juan Carlos pointed out that he likes to, or not likes to, you have to change uh, in order for the email to work properly. And in that document, I explain how you could set up emails uh, to go to a default person or even to different people at each site. And um, it was, well, I'm not gonna, that's a long story, but anyway. Um, the other thing, it boggles my mind when somebody installs Green Global and when you open up their website, it has the U.S. National Plant Germplasm Distribution Policy. That's an easy parameter to change, okay? So in the public website, um, there's a file called Site Master. This is in the new release of the public website, but it's in the Green Global. And uh, that can be changed, um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back to here. This is the file, I have this in the wrong place. If you go to your um, SQL Server Management Studio and you go to App Setting, that table has that banner information you are accessing a government information. So all you need to do is change this value to whatever you want it to be, and then that gets rid of that stuff about the USDA. So I need to make a note in the how to get started with Green Global. Uh, there's a document I've got up there, but this is something you do, it's very easy to do, very quick, and you use it through SQL Server Management Studio. The other thing is uh, with the new public website, there are various ASPX pages and also the site master um, is, uh, you can open that up in a text editor and you can make some changes within the document, within the uh, actual file. So again, um, you'll see text. Now this to me is a, a, a major faux pas because ideally, we should not have in these files this hard-coded English. And um, I'm gonna talk to the developers some more about this because we were trying to get away from that and in the new public website, I think they actually introduced uh, more. So, so anyway, um, things that go bump in the dark, I put together an online document um, this is, uh, I'll come back to that, but that's online. You'll be able to get to it. And after this lesson, I'd like you to read that, look at some of the examples. And I just, I've been dumping a bunch of things. I'll talk about that some more, but sometimes, um, things will happen. This is an example that I've put in there. So when your password has expired, and that usually happens when somebody modifies their password because otherwise the default password has an expiration date that's usually three or four years old, uh, three or four years in the future. But uh, it could happen that it expired. There are ways that you could run a script to update that uh, so that you could get past that problem. Okay, let me go back. I wanted to show you this. This one just came the other day. I think I have this in a document, but this is the type of thing I'm gonna include in that document. So um, let me stop the screen again for a second. And I'm gonna do something. And Juan Carlos saw this the other day, we saw this, this was kind of, I thought it was humorous because this happens every once in a blue moon. It doesn't happen that often.
what I'm doing is loading the curator tool. I want to do something to it. And then I'm going to. All right. And then I'm going to go out. And now I'm going to share my screen again. There we go. And now I'm going to start the CT again. Everything looks cool. By the way, just for the heck of it, I went in and changed mine and said, you are not accessing a, a US government information system. Okay. Now, um, a user reported the other day, they said, something's screwy on my screen. Look at the buttons. And it's in many places. Um, anybody have an idea other than Juan Carlos, what happened? Juan Carlos is the ringer. He has the answer. Fortunately, this happens rarely, but it will happen. Okay, I have no takers. Um, it's interesting. Um, I don't know how the user did this, but this was a user error. Uh, maybe you should argue it should be user preventable, uh, but nevertheless, it happened. Um, as you all know, up here, there's a menu. And it's interesting that this says tools but the other two changed. So that tells me there's something screwy in the database. But if I go to here, normally this would have said file. And then here, it would have said change password language or file exit. Um, what happened is each of these items is an entry in, the, in a table under app settings. But um, the user the other day must have accidentally, not aware with their mouse, probably this is what happened. Uh, they changed from English to system. And so for whatever reason, the curator tool is using the system parameters. And so all the user had to do was go back to English but then it says your lookup tables, you need to update those. I'm gonna say no, because I know my lookup tables are still fine in English, because I didn't change them when I switched the system. But see how it corrected things. So all they had accidentally done is somehow they went to there. Maybe they were trying to go to ENG and when they did that. So anyway. Um, that is basically what I wanted to cover. Um, I, I, I wanted to talk about going forward. I used to have a lot of tips and things that I kept track of myself, but I'm gonna start putting them out there in this document called uh, the debugging guide. And I'll have that for now, it's accessed through our page that we've created for this webinar series. But I'm going to put that online in the um, USDA uh, Green Global Project uh, website that I maintain. And I'm actually gonna change that around this month when things are a little bit quieter. Um, but what I was gonna suggest that to you all in the community 
if you have a case where you've solved something and you thought that it was something you would like to share with others, why don't you send that to me? And you can send me an email with a, a Word document or with some screens or whatever, and um, I'll curate it. I'll, I'll edit it, put it into the document if I think it's uh, general, for, would be helpful for everybody in general. So right now this document has, I don't know, 10 or 12 pages, but I know I can dig around and find some other examples of things that uh, will be happening to a green global database. And I have a table of contents. And so I'm trying to identify each problem by a title so that you can quickly do a search in the document. And hopefully that will be an asset uh, going forward. So um, things like this, you know, if you if you saw this, and you've got some kind of error message. Uh, like I would put that error message in the document and then say, well, here's what you can do. Okay. So lessons learned. Uh, I wanted to build in, and we only have a few minutes, but does anybody want to share anything that they learned? Um, I don't know if he's still here. You've seen, I keep seeing his thing going in and out. Or Juan Carlos or Mattia or anybody, Grace. Uh, the folks at Erie uh, that have a lot of experience now with Green Global, anything that they uh, think other users, especially newer uh, sites, should uh, be aware of. And be gentle. You can unmute. Well, uh, with that, I was while I was waiting, I was looking at my other screen. I was looking at back at Matias' question, and um, let me just show you a demonstration of something here. I'm going to go. Let's see what I have to do to do this. Let me close the curator tool, and then we're going to call it a day. But um, uh, let me go to here and. Um, program data, right, okay. Uh, so when I look at this, this is, this folder, Green Global Local Host, okay, has all of those files. Now I'm looking at the size and they're all small, relatively small because there's not much data in this database, hardly anything at all. So my point was, if the lookup tables were screwed up, um, you can completely wipe out these files and or the folder. So I'm just gonna be lazy and delete the folder. So bingo. And I'm going to move this over to here. And I'm gonna start up the curator tool again. So watch what happens over here when we do this. You see what it's doing? It immediately, well, shoot, it took up most of the screen. But what it did was it built that folder again. And it's starting, all right, uh, let me get that screen over here.
So I just rebuilt that. And um, now as I update the lookups and as I increase data, these files will grow in size. I was looking to see how large they are on the production side. And um, even though the USDA has a large database, it, um, they're not that big. The biggest one is inventory, of course. So um, I think I'm getting a notice that my friend is now live. And uh, I would say, Juan Carlos, do you have anything to say? We're getting close to the end. Okay, now in this case, please, uh, as you know, uh, the admin tool is a tool that must be, we say, managed by the one person or two. It's not, the admin tool is not to, to the gym bank users. Yes, because across to the admin tool, you need to modify or assign many different kind of the administration issues or things. In this case, it's important that only one person or two need to manage or to administrate this, this tool. This is the, the measure that I send to you. Obviously, uh, as a curator tool, uh, before, or I guess before to this uh, session, many people will, uh, will use the admin tool and please send to us any problem that you find across to the help desk. A service. This is my my comments in this case. Absolutely, I echo that. And I would also emphasize, it would be ideal if you have two people who know what they're doing with the admin tool. So, if you have one person, and of course, if they're sick or whatever, uh, it's it's a it's a problem sometimes. So. I know at the USDA, we have two people and one is considered to be the true Green Global Database Administrator, and that's uh, now Benjamin, who replaced Quinn, but Kurt is able to do everything that Benjamin can. In fact, Kurt has more experience, really. So he defers, but he can be the backup, and they're backups for each other, really. But nobody else. I'm always frustrated because I want to see what's on their admin tool and I can't, um, they don't trust me. So, um, and I don't have access to that box. So what they do is they'll copy screens for me or send me the text file if it's pertinent. So um, it is almost nine o'clock here in the East Coast of the US and um, as always, please send us uh, your emails, uh, especially Juan Carlos is the International Help Desk, and I'm here to help too. And if you have any questions about these webinars, and we'll try to make sure that they're accessible. And um, anyway, we started with this, it seemed like a long time ago, but it was only three weeks ago, and I really enjoyed it. It made me put my head and wrap around the admin tool, which I don't normally have to do. But um, it was good to put these together and try to put a lot of the material in one place for future reference. So I hope, hope it was helpful. I uh, hope uh, that you have a safe and happy holiday and good year and, and take care. So that's all I've got. Thank you to all. Uh, thank you always, always to Marty. Uh, I appreciate your support, Marty, in this webinar. And again, sure. uh, any question, any suggestion, comment regarding to this uh, webinar, you can send to us across to the help desk uh, service. And thank you to all. Happy New Year, ha happy holidays. And if somebody has question, comments, uh, go ahead, please. In the chat. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Grace. Good to see you. See you again, Grace, sort of. Yep. All right. Thank God. And you, by the way, I forgot to mention there will be homework. <laughs> so I'm going to.
put some more on this. Hey, Marty. Right, I'm Carlos. Hey. Marty. Uh, Matias. Yeah. Uh, no, it just uh, was uh, quite interesting to follow the uh, the presentations, even though I did not uh, uh, participate super actively. <laughs> uh, but it shows there's a bunch of uh, different bits and pieces that, that hold stuff together. Um, yeah. And you do need to know what's going on and you do need to, you know, sort of have some expertise and experience to, you know, figure stuff out. Uh, so it's not not simply a you know point and shoot kind of thing. It's more of it, it does require um, a deeper understanding of its design and how it functions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you one more time. Feliz Navidad. Yeah. See you soon. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Adios. Thanks, Juan Carlos. You're welcome. And you can, I guess, stop the recording and. We'll